Hello, everyone. This is Dr. Pruitt. Welcome back to more continuing education. Today, we're going to be talking about blast injuries and some trauma associated with those. It's important to note that bombings and blast injuries are increasingly prevalent over time, which is exceedingly unfortunate because these are severe injuries. But if you, And they're usually associated with terrorist attacks. If you look at the number of attacks over the last 20 years, you can see here that it's increasing exponentially, not just the number of blasts, but also the number of mass casualties, especially remarkable over the last 10 years. And if you look in the U.S., not just worldwide, we see the same trend. So terror incidents in the U.S. over the last 15 years also shows increasing attacks as well as increasing number of fatalities. It's important to note that 70% of mass casualty incidents that cause a significant amount of fatalities are usually due to explosions. So explosions are a very common method of terrorist attack, but they're also very deadly and they cause a lot of devastation and destruction, not just to infrastructure, but also to people. And the problem with this is that bomb making material is very easily accessible on the internet and easy to do at home. And this is no wonder that it's a favorite attack method for terrorists, right? It's easy to do and it's largely effective. Looking at terrorist events over time, of course, we've learned a lot about blast injuries from our recent experiences in our wars in Iraq and Afghanistan as improvised explosive devices are a tool that the insurgents frequently use to combat our forces. It's also important to note, though, that not all explosions are related to terrorism. Um, explosions are frequently occurring in meth labs. These are very unstable chemical compounds, sometimes in less than, very less than ideal settings. Dangerous chemistry performed in dangerous areas can lead to a large amount of explosions. And then also industrial accidents can occur as well. There's two types of explosives that are important to know, and this differentiates the kinds of injury patterns that you would see. So low order explosives do not have a blast or a pressure wave. And these kind of explosives would include pipe bombs or gunpowder or Molotov cocktails. These are not large enough to cause an increase of pressure in the atmosphere surrounding the explosion. The ones we really worry about and are most destructive are high order explosives. And this tends to be your plastic explosives or C4, it can be dynamite, nitroglycerin, ammonium nitrate fuel oil is one of them. And all of these things can be accessed on the internet. Um, but what makes them dangerous is that they create a really strong supersonic pressure wave that initiates the series of blast injuries to the surrounding area, but also to the patients in the blast range. And the way that this works from a physics and chemistry standpoint is that what you have is a solid or a liquid that is rapidly turned into a gas. And this gas, just like most gases, wants to expand, but it expands very quickly. And it expands so fast that it compresses the surrounding air and it creates this massive wave. And so as that gas expands and creates the wave, you can see here on this first graph, if you're outside in an open space, there's just an initial large release of energy and then it exponentially decreases over time and returns back to the atmospheric pressure as the gas dissolves. However, if you're in a closed space, that wave just reverberates back and forth between the enclosed space and there's multiple waves and things get bounced back and forth as that gas is looking for an area to escape. And it takes a much longer time for the area to return to atmospheric pressure and it also causes multiple waves that inflict more damage. So when we're looking at injury patterns related to blasts, there's this is textbook knowledge for for um, blast injury patterns, but you have primary, secondary, and tertiary injury patterns that you should expect in all of your patients. And there's also quaternary that we'll talk about later. But your primary injuries, if you think about it, these are gonna be your patients that are closest to the blast. And this is gonna be injuries that are due to that big blast wave, the expanding gases, it's overpressure wave. And this is mostly gonna affect hollow organs. So primary is due to the blast wave itself. 
Secondary injuries are due to basically shrapnel or penetrating injuries or fragments from the blast wave when things break apart, and this can cause blunt or penetrating trauma. And then tertiary injuries are the injuries, typically these are orthopedic, and this is from the body actually physically being thrown against other objects, whether that's the ground or other walls or other objects that are a little heavier that didn't move with the blast. So primary, secondary, tertiary, primary, mostly hollow organ injury, secondary, mostly penetrating injury, and tertiary is mostly orthopedic from blunt trauma. So when we talk about hollow organs and you're assessing your patients who are closer to the initial blast wave, the organs you need to think about are the ears, eyes, and sinuses up near the face and the neck. The lungs obviously are hollow organs as well, and then the GI tract. And the thing that's difficult about these primary injuries is they can be the most severe and the most deadly type of injuries, but they're also the injuries that are the hardest to see. So we really have no way to see the lungs, right, or the GI tract, but these hollow organs, as a result of that big pressure wave, can really sustain some significant damage. And the ears and the eyes and the sinuses as well. So one of the only things you have to rely on on your physical exam about patients who may have sustained this primary blast injury due to the pressure wave is looking at their tympanic membranes. Now, I know you don't have the ability to look in people's ears and look at their tympanic membrane, and you're not used to doing this, but what you can look for is blood coming out of their ears or asking them if they have pain in their ears or they might be deaf or have ringing in their ears or be very dizzy. These are things that you can ask about on your history or look for in your physical exam to suggest that there may be further hollow viscous injury going on. Now, when you think about the ear, that ear drum is a very thin membrane that covers the bones of the ear that conduct hearing. And if this membrane is ruptured, there might be some bleeding from behind it. It can be torn. This will cause decreased hearing because there's decreased conductions to the bones that vibrate to form sound. So it can be damage to the outside ear. The bones themselves, depending on how big the pressure wave is, can actually disrupt the bones in the ear. The tympanic membrane can be ruptured. And then not only that, but with our vestibular system, the ears are very important in helping people keep their balance. And so these patients might be very dizzy as well. So these are things to look for that may suggest further hollow viscous injury. If you see this, you want to pay close attention to your vital signs and your lungs and look for any abdominal pain. Unfortunately, eye injury occurs in almost a third of these patients who are close to the primary blast and experience that blast wave. Globe rupture, again, your eye is basically a hollow organ. So the eye can physically rupture. There can also be penetrating injury that causes globe rupture, or the eyes can be burned, depending on how close they are to the, to the flames. So it's important to do a really good head, eyes, ears, nose, throat exam on your patients to understand what's going on with them. Importantly, you want to look at their pupils. If you see that their pupil is abnormally shaped, like a teardrop, or sometimes it's a little more obvious if there's severe ocular trauma. You can see here there's a abnormally shaped eye with opacified cornea and a lot of injection and drainage from the eye. And then ask about vision loss. You can hold up your fingers, ask if they can see, try to tell color, can they see light? Those are all important um, questions to ask. If you do have a patient with an eye injury, just remember in an effort to try to attempt to save their vision, if that's at all possible, you want to decrease any intrathoracic or intracranial pressure. So make sure you're aggressively treating their nausea and then cover the eye that's injured to prevent any further injury. Remembering not to touch the eye, but use a a soft gauze or like maybe a styrofoam cup or whatever you have on scene. Don't directly touch the eye itself, but cover it to protect it. One of the most deadly injuries that occurs in primary blast is blast lung. This is the most fatal type of injury, and sometimes it can take up to 48 hours to develop. It it is inflammation that develops over time, but sometimes the initial injury is enough to be fatal as well. Essentially what happens is in a normal lung, you have air coming in and it abuts the capillaries where it can do its normal gas exchange. But here you have with the overpressure wave that occurs, the capillaries are very thin-walled and easily ruptured. 
And those capillaries, when they rupture, they have nowhere else to go but into the alveoli. So essentially, all the small parts of the lungs are filled with blood that's deoxygenated or oxygenated. And that causes massive amounts of inflammation because you have fluid where it should not be. And so initially, if it's bad enough and all of these alveoli rupture, you just have lungs that are filled with blood. But over time, even if you have a smaller amount of the lungs that have sustained this injury, the inflammatory cascade after the initial injury is sometimes enough to um, cause the fatality. And not only that, but with the lungs, we'll talk about air embolism in just a minute, but air embolism is basically the opposite. So Blast lung is when the vessels rupture and go into the alveoli. Air embolism is when the alveoli rupture and there's massive amounts of air released into the circulatory system. Either way, you're not getting adequate ventilation or perfusion, and both of these can lead to fatal injuries. So here's some pictures of lungs that have undergone blast injury. You see here this lung is just full of fluid. Um, on the chest x-ray, it looks like this. I know you're not used to looking at chest x-rays, but these areas here should be nice and black. And you can see here that they're full of, full of fluid. And this is what it looks like on the CAT scan as well. You can see the silhouette of the heart here, but all of these lungs, it should be areas nice, nice black where air is going in and out to do its ventilation and perfusion. They're full of socked in fluid and there's not enough room to do any air and gas exchange. This is what it looks like. I think here they're doing a thoracotomy trying to, um, I'm not sure what they're trying to do, but this is a picture of a lung that basically is just shredded and full of blood due to a blast injury. Air embolus, we just mentioned, this is where, due to the blast, air from the alveoli enters into the bloodstream, and this goes directly into the left ventricle, and if there's enough air, it can cause essentially signs of infarction, so stroke, stomach, hypoxia, um, it can lead to sudden death if uh, air is in the wrong wrong space. It's not meant to be inside the circulatory system unless it's carried by hemoglobin. And if there's a large enough embolus of air, it can lead to sudden death. Another hollow organ that's very prone to injury is the abdomen. Um, injuries that are common are intestinal hemorrhage, just like we saw with the lungs. It's a hollow tube. The vessels around it can rupture and cause bleeding. Um, the bowel itself can rupture. There's also many vessels that lead to the gut, and those can shear depending on the angle and direction of the force. And not only that, but the solid organs, um, liver, spleen, and actually the testicles, depending on the force of the blast wave, can actually rupture as well. So pretty severe abdominal injuries can occur with blasts. And not only that, but the brain is frequently injured as well. So there's a, with the blast wave, there's a very sudden increase in intracranial pressure. And there's, I don't know if you remember back to your anatomy, but there's gray matter and there's white matter, and these each have a different density. And so when they experience a wave, whether it's a coup contra coup injury or a sudden impact or a sudden wave, the different densities of materials move at different velocities. And this causes a shearing injury between the gray and the white matter. So we call that diffuse axonal injury, and it essentially cuts off communication from the midbrain to the outer cortex. And you can see here in this image, there's still connections. The brain looks essentially normal on the outside, and there's still signals being sent in the midbrain. And normally they go all the way out to the cortex to conduct the messaging. But here you can see that a lot of the messaging that should be occurring has been sheared off and the messages aren't able to get out to the cortex. So that's a severe axonal injury. Sometimes on CAT scan you can see these punctate little areas of bleeding here. That's also suggestive of diffuse axonal injury. Not only the shear injury do you need to think about, um, but coup, contra coup injuries, you can get intracranial hemorrhages, just like any blunt head trauma, intracranial contusion, concussion, hemorrhage, all of those things that you would normally think about in a badly uh, head injured trauma patient. Okay, so that's it for primary injuries, mostly hollow organs. Look at the eyes, look at the ears, think about the lungs, aggressively manage that airway, and then examine the belly. For the secondary blast injuries, this is mostly your penetrating trauma from flying debris. And again, these terrorists are kind of 
nefarious, they figure out all kinds of ways to make this as destructive as possible. I know you've probably heard about the, the pressure cooker bomb that was used in Boston with the nails and the screws and all the all the debris that was inside of there. But it doesn't need to be that big. Um, you can look at the shrapnel here that's wrapped around this little tiny pipe bomb that's made out of PVC. Um, here's a picture of one that they found in Iraq that's just full of nails and other debris just to increase the destruction. So actually, these penetrating injuries that are caused from the secondary blast are the most common cause of death and explosions. And here's what some of them look like. I know you've seen penetrating injuries before, but these tend to be very extensive depending on the proximity to the blast. And so here you see a child that was too close to the blast and is just covered in penetrating injury. They might look like this, like little shotgun pellets. Or sometimes, you can see here, these, this patient has extensive multi-system trauma. Not only does he likely have some fractures, but he's got penetrating injuries, as well as probably some blast injury and vascular damage as well. So anytime you have penetrating injuries, treat them like you normally would. Um, control any bleeding that you possibly can. And then have a very high degree of suspicion for any underlying injury realizing that whatever that projectile was, it probably went inside to the body and caused some massive damage to internal organs. Traumatic amputations are also not uncommon in blast injuries. A lot of these blasts are initiated by some sort of pressure like a, a mine or an IED, and what happens is if someone steps on them, um, the blast goes up through the heel and basically shreds through the bone, the muscle, and the vasculature to cause pretty severe injury. And depending on the size of the blast, can go all the way up into the groin and into the abdomen. So if you have a patient that has this type of injury, of course, treat it like you would any traumatic amputation. You want to make sure you're placing your tourniquets and controlling any hemorrhage as fast as you possibly can. If there's any fractures that are worth splinting just to help control pain and facilitate movement, make sure you're splinting the fractures as best as you can. Obviously, you're going to want to treat pain. And then if there's any associated burns, you want to treat those as well. So that's it for secondary. Make sure you're just treating penetrating injuries like you normally would. Control bleeding, control pain, splint injuries if possible. As we move on to tertiary blast injuries, these are the ones that are a little farther from the initial blast where people get thrown against immobile objects. And so here you're thinking blunt trauma. This is mostly going to be orthopedic and closed head injuries, um, concussions, intracranial hemorrhage, and even, you know, skull fractures or C-spine injuries are common. Make sure you're thinking about C-spine your normal fracture management. So splint any fractures that you see. Make sure you're documenting good pulse movement and sensation on the distal extremity. And then have a low suspicion for crush injury, especially if this patient is taking a long time to be extricated. I imagine that this this young man here, it's going to take a while to get him out from under all that debris. And so make sure you're thinking about crush injury and all the sequelae from that as well. So um, hydration, hyperkalemia, all of those things. Quaternary injury is mostly due to inhalation and the secondary effects of the blast with all the dust and debris that is kicked up and comes in through the lungs. This can also be radiation exposure or chemical exposure. So it's very important in these blasts to consider what exploded exactly and make sure you have your PPE on and are thinking safety first. And then Ask yourself if you need to decontaminate your patient before you transport them or get them to definitive care. Not only radiation and chemical and inhalation injuries occur, but sometimes people with chronic lung disease can have exacerbations of their asthma or other underlying conditions. So it's fall into the quaternary category. Although you should be thinking about quaternary injuries first. This is not the order to think about these injuries. It's just a classification of types of injuries. So always question when you're going into a scene like this whether there could be biochemical hazards that you need to be prepared for. And speaking of quaternary blast injuries, what we learned from 9-11 is that there's been a multitude of very unfortunate sequelae to the to the firefighters and responders that responded to the Twin Towers on 9-11 cancers, lung injury, all kinds of exposures that have happened years later that didn't happen initially but have manifested as pretty severe diseases 
after the fact. So make sure you're considering this when you're going into any blast zone. Uh, if you need to wear a respirator or your SCBA, then do that. Also for your patients, when you're going in here and you see them inhaling smoke and dust like this, make sure you're considering if they were in a closed space, you need to think about carbon monoxide and cyanide exposure as well. So like I just said, these are a classification system with the primary to the quaternary types of injuries, but this is not necessarily a order of operations and how to treat your patient. Just realize that these patients have a multitude of injuries. They're going to have blast injuries, which are hollow organ injuries, which you may not be able to see. You'll also have to be treating penetrating trauma, but blunt trauma and potentially also burns. And so this is the ultimate trauma patient where you need to constantly switch between your thought process on how to treat them and what injury is most severe and which injury you need to treat first. It's very important to have a high degree of suspicion for head injury in these patients as they get thrown around with a blast wave. And remember, this is the same for any head injury, but you really want to prevent hypotension and hypoxia in your head injury patients if you can, because that's if they get hypotensive or hypoxic, that really increases their mortality. So aggressively manage these airways, do your best to prevent hypoxia, address that early, and then make sure you're controlling bleeding aggressively as well and allowing that permissive hypotension, titrating your fluids and your efforts to a systolic of 90. Just a quick review on burn management. Um, my favorite method to estimate the depth and severity of burns Make sure you're, you're documenting whether it's superficial, deep, or third degree. And then using the patient's palm is essentially 1% of their body surface area. So that's a really quick way to estimate how much, how much burn they've experienced. Do your best to get all their clothing removed. Pay really close attention to their airway if there's inhalation concerns. Obtain IV access if you can, and mostly that's for fluids and pain management. And make sure you're not putting any ointments or salves on the burns, but cover them with a clean, dry sheet and do your best to keep them warm after you've done your primary and secondary trauma surveys. Quick reminder on orthopedic injuries as well. Priorities are controlling hemorrhage, especially with open fractures, then splint for comfort and also ease of transport, and then do your best to control pain. It's always very important to check for distal pulse and their ability to move and have sensation in that distal extremity that's fractured. But understanding in a situation like this, you're probably going to be pressed for time in your patient care and might not have as much time as you normally would to do a good neurovascular exam. But it does really help when you get to the hospital to say how acute these patients are if you have loss of pulse in the distal extremity. Always please, please, please remember that your safety is first. You can't help anybody else if you are not first taking care of yourself. So make sure you have all of your appropriate PPE and the scene is safe before you go in. Just a quick reminder about start triage as well. Just as you're looking at a multitude of patients and you're trying to figure out who needs to be transported and who does not, you quickly look at who are they breathing, do they have a peripheral pulse, and what's their mental status. If their respiratory rate is over 30, they're red. If they have no radial pulse, they're red. If their mental status is not able to follow simple commands, they're red. If they have no respiratory effort at all, they're black, leave them, move on. If they're walking wounded, they go to probably a tent or some collection area. They don't need transport right away. And if they don't fall in any of those other categories, then they are considered yellow and can be delayed. But again, your yellow is probably your most dangerous patient population, so make sure you have someone to reassess them continually because they might look good initially but can quickly decompensate. So an important note here is in your triage efforts, make sure you have one, someone to do consistent reassessments. And just with basic trauma care in an MCI setting, control extremity hemorrhage and then manage your ABCs. And you can't go wrong if you're addressing those things first. So extremity hemorrhage, airway, breathing, and circulation. And remember, please remember, continual reassessment is key to helping prevent further injuries in these patients. So making sure you're getting a good set of initial vitals and then reassessing them regularly to um, make sure you're headed in the right direction with your treatment. And that's all I have. If you have any questions, please either feel free to reach out to me or ask your 7-8.